We've been bringing you some of our favorite stories of the past year with the producers and correspondents who work both in front of and behind the camera. Hari Srinivasan sat down recently with PBS NewsHour producer Sam Weber, who along with producer Kony Cargbo spent a good amount of time on the road with Hari this year. Sam Weber, you are part of uh, a two-person team, Kony Cargbo, who managed to sneak out for the holidays before, it's true. before we got here uh, to this table. Living Shorelines was an idea you guys came to me with that I had not even heard of. Um, for actually, how did that story come about? Well, the truth is it, it wasn't even our idea. So this was uh, an idea by one of our frequent collaborators at Climate Central, which is a non-advocacy, um, non-profit research and journalism organization that we've worked with a bunch in the past. So one of their reporters, John Upton, had this idea for looking at this really sort of unique way of dealing with the energy that comes from the water and dealing with, you know, what could potentially be a bigger issue as sea levels continue to rise. And the more that we dug into it, the truth is it was a really interesting and, and frankly sort of counterintuitive idea mm -hmm. that something that was not a hard wall, not a seawall, not putting up a giant concrete barrier, something that was a little bit more at least natural seeming, put into the water could actually do a better job than something that was a lot firmer and, and in place. Here in Pensacola, Florida, just like the rest of the southeast or much of the eastern seaboard, coasts have to deal with large storms and hurricanes. But there's a growing body of research that suggests living shorelines like this one are more resilient through storms than hardened shorelines like seawalls. It looks today as good, if not better, than before the hurricane. Daryl Boudreaux is the watershed coordinator for the Nature Conservancy. He showed us a 30-acre living shoreline project in downtown Pensacola called Project Green Shores. The first part was completed in 2003, one year before Hurricane Ivan hammered the region. Hurricane Ivan was a Category 3 hurricane, but it was basically a direct hit. It washed away the road on I-10 further up the bay. That's how powerful that storm was. But the, the road behind Project Green Shores was really not damaged. The experience with Project Greenshores in Pensacola is not unique. In North Carolina, researchers documented how living shorelines like this one were barely damaged after Hurricane Irene in 2011. While about 100 yards away, this hardened shoreline had to be completely replaced. And then there's sea level rise. Climate change is expected to push seas in this region up between 2 and 5 feet over the next 80 years. We've got two different strategies to deal with sea level rise. You've got a solid wall and you've got this marsh. What's going to do better? I, I would say over time, the marsh is going to do better. The, the sea wall is sort of a fixed point. So it's a fixed height, it's a fixed location. With sea level rise, the water levels are going to increase. And, and the only way to adapt a hardened structure is to come back with a higher structure. One of my memories from that story is a stretch on a basically a party barge that really, pontoon boat pontoon yeah. boat that should just be on flat water and we were on anything but it started out very calm um, and as we traveled out but then of course as soon as we kind of got out into that Pensacola Bay it was a little bumpy a little bumpy but you know I think we really felt like it was important that if we were going to be able to get some footage of this major project in Pensacola and we were out with one of the real architects of this project it was nice to be able to see it from that perspective sure. but of course then we had to get back um, and unbeknownst to us I think the wind had maybe picked up a little bit um, just a little just a little we you know in full disclosure we might not be the the most experienced sailors that were out on the Pensacola Bay that day and things got a little bit choppy that is one example of one of the stories that we've done on climate here in the United States. And uh, Coney, you and I also just went to Scotland recently to do a couple of follow-up pieces as well. Yeah, I mean, I think as a as a program, um, it's been really interesting sort of covering some of these emerging energy technologies, particularly when we think about what are some of those maybe more outside the box solutions for climate change. And so we had done some reporting over the years on ocean energy technologies, including wave energy. We had some colleagues do a piece on that and actually a tidal energy project here in the United States. But this was actually an idea that didn't come from us, but actually came from you. So I'm, I'd be sort of curious, <laughs> what, what, what made you see this as a, as a place to particularly go, and, and honestly, as a technology to particularly focus on? You know, I, look, I don't own shares in any of these particular companies. I'm, uh, my, I love Scotland, but it's not the, the place that I want to go every week. I think it's just that there are things that are happening all over the planet where companies and countries are seizing opportunities to s figure out 
how to change, to adapt to climate change, how to profit from climate change, how to get us off fossil fuels. This isn't sort of agenda-driven reporting. It's just more that all this stuff is happening whether we choose to, at this moment in time, invest there or not. Right? So whether this is happening in Scotland or something else might be happening in Egypt, something else is happening in India, lots of stuff is happening in China. Technologies are emerging, countries are investing, companies are investing, and this is going to be part of what's necessary if we're going to transition in any way away from fossil fuels. So I just find it kind of interesting to take a look at these other places. And of course, it also gave us plenty of opportunity to shoot a correspondent, not only in various <laughs> various hard hats, different types of aquatic safety gear, yeah, including yeah, that's fun. life-saving, uh, I don't know what you would even call it. I don't even it, know what like that was. Life-saving suit. suit yeah. And then seeing, you know, everyone does their best to go literally down the hatch into a, a major tidal <laughs> energy project. No, it's cool. I think it's cool. I think it's one of those things that you want to try to figure out how to communicate back to an audience. Like, what what is the type of stuff that I can tell you how something feels or how something smells that you can't get just from a nice picture that we, we have great cameras, we can take great pictures, but a, a correspondent I think is one of the ways that they can help tell a story is to, to help somebody at home understand what it's like to stand someplace or feel something or smell something. Uh, but you and Coney seem to get me into weird situations. I've had my foot stuck in weird swamps with you guys. This is pretty silty. This just sinks right in. I've nice put things on my head. This is very Amelia Earhart, old school. Well, I, th I really think that if you're not going to take advantage of, of having the anchor of your show out in the field and being able to put an fMRI machine on his head to uh, give him a test early in the morning to see how well he can count backward from 100 by sevens. <laughs> 16, uh, 9, 2. Thank God it's over. <laughs> the idea that you'd be willing to do that and, and be willing to sort of put yourself in the shoes of somebody who was going through that test, where researchers are, you know, we had some fun with it, but they're working on a very serious policy problem. And I really think it's a unique opportunity to be able to sort of really show the viewer what that process is like and, and what those researchers are learning from it. Um, and we're certainly really happy that you've been sort of game to do that with us um, over these past year, years, you know? Willing guinea pig. Sam Weber, thanks so much, and Coney Cargbo in absentia. Thanks Absolutely. so much.